and welcome to this special edition of In the Know. I'm Helen Raptus. And I'm Chad Young. Thanks for joining us. For the next half hour, we're going to show you how Vancouver Public Schools are incorporating technology into the classroom. It's an initiative called We Learn. Here's what it's all about. Anybody with kids knows they're way ahead of their parents when it comes to technology. They're using handheld devices, tablets, and advanced computer software. In fact, they don't know a world where these tools don't exist. Cutting edge digital technology is already entrenching itself in just about every industry. It's the school district's job as educators to prepare students for college and careers. So it's using these same technological tools to improve learning for kids. It's not about playing around with neat gadgets. It's about using every resource possible to educate and inspire kids. Back in October, the district held its first ever We Learn event, a technology exposition at Hudson's Bay High School. Dozens of students and teachers gave demonstrations, and I was there to soak it all in. It's wonderful. The more math and science we can get to these kids, the better. That's the idea behind We Learn, Technology Showcase 2010. Educators demonstrated the new ways they're using computers and other technology to engage students. Some are media focused, like video production. Others are based in traditional subjects like geography and reading. Other displays, like the robotics program at Skyview, gave a glimpse at practical applications of math, science, and engineering. The students who create these machines are excited to share their passion for robotics. I just really enjoyed building everything. It's, it's a great thing for people to get into if you have any kind of want in uh, mechanics or engineering. It's a great thing to join and do. Parents came away impressed. The motor skills that they're putting into building these projects. And they tell us their kids took notice too. They are ready to go to Skyview High School. An event of this scale took a lot of time to prepare. The idea began last year and really took shape this summer. More than 40 school-sponsored booths, plus vendor booths, filled the Commons area at Hudson's Bay High School. Volunteers arrived early to set up their displays. Superintendent Steve Webb appreciated the effort it took to get this event off the ground. I'm absolutely thrilled with the turnout, uh, the quality of the um, presentations. Um, kids are just absolutely thrilled and excited uh, to showcase how they're using technology as a learning tool. It's those high-tech learning tools that have people talking about what's happening in Vancouver classrooms. I'm really surprised by the amount of Apple technology and uh, personal use technology that they're involving and making it a very one-on-one -on -one experience for the students. This is just hot. I, I would like this at home. <laughs> extent that they're using technology throughout the district at all the different grade levels because I think when you have a student in one grade you may not be aware of how extensive it is. Um, you only see a very small piece of what your student is getting and not realizing the breadth of what's out there. You know you can get a sense that there's quite a bit of buzz in the room, quite a bit of energy around what's happening. The district is already planning the next We Learn event for October 2011, and it hopes to reach even more people this time around. A pilot program at Jason Lee Middle School is bridging the gap between home and school. Nick Bowl shows us how. This is a pen. It may not look like much, but think about it. At some point, this was brand new technology. Now we just use it to get our work done and forget about it. Well, that's sort of the idea behind a new program at Jason Lee. It's so cool. That's pretty much the reaction you'll get from any sixth grader at Jason Lee. This is so sweet. Each of them has been assigned a laptop computer as part of a pilot program. On that computer, students use software called Cognite, which connects each of them to a class calendar and allows them to collaborate on math, social studies, and other subjects. It also empowers them to self-direct their own learning and stay focused on their lessons even at home. This is really going to help the kids stay on top of their assignments, stay on top of the work. It will allow parents to see immediately what it is my students are working on. The work can be completed at home. Parents can get engaged with the work being completed at home. In the classroom, the laptops and Cognite system will give teachers more flexibility. Instead of just having one period a day where they can go to a lab to do those things, the teacher can work um, the use of the computers into their day and use them when they need them and then pack them away when they don't. Not having to share a computer with classmates also teaches students personal responsibility. I like it because then I can't be blamed for something that someone else did. So you're just sort of responsible for yourself? Yes. The laptops and the software that connects them all are quickly being integrated into classwork. 
and the kids, maybe even faster than the adults, saw the potential for this because the kids are light years ahead of all of us um, with technologies we all know. And we get them in the hands at sixth grade. By the time they're in high school, it's second nature and the technology goes away and it just becomes a powerful tool that they use and the fact that it's a cool gadget isn't really a part of the, you know, even how they think about it anymore. Just like the ballpoint pen. For In the Know, I'm Nick Vole. Mr. Lee's fifth grade class at Sacagawea Elementary isn't content to just try out one new device. It incorporated several into one project. This story is told by Hannah, Brent, Taylor. The class split into groups to produce and record radio plays. The learning target was to increase reading fluency and comprehension. Every group used the same source material, a Native American story called A Boy Called Slow. To assemble it, they first practiced reading it out loud in front of the class. Then they recorded all the parts using iPad 2s, which came courtesy of a grant. It was up to the students to decide how to present their version, so they had to think critically to find the most effective way to tell the story. Not a lot of narration, because it doesn't make it sound really good. It makes it sound more like a story, and you want to make it sound like a play. Learn to follow in his father's path. Now we have learn to follow in his father's path. Okay. That's, must be Chad there, huh? Yeah, I'm going to drag that over a little bit because we don't want those long pauses. After the voices were recorded, students added music and sound effects on laptop computers. The finished products were then played for the whole class. Using handheld responder devices, the students voted for their favorite, which Mr. Lee then posted to his class website. Mr. Lee's class and the rest of the fifth graders at Sacagawea are a pretty advanced bunch. In addition to the radio plays, they also are producing their own TV shows. Colleen Nelson has more. I'm Natani at the Math Carnival. We're having lots of fun here learning. The now stories are smaller, but so too are the journalists. Fifth graders at Sacagawea Elementary in Vancouver are keeping their entire school in the loop with not one, but two news programs. We started Channel 7 News a few years back, uh, kind of as a way as, uh, for the whole school to come together in the morning. Indigenous people, for liberty and justice for all. Every morning we say that the Pledge of Allegiance and what's for lunch and like if something's coming up. Um. Every fifth grader at Sacagawea has a chance to help out, either on the morning news or their news magazine show, which comes out every two weeks. The students are learning every element of video production, which helps them learn other subjects. I used to be afraid to sometimes do things on the computer if I deleted it something, but now I know what to do. And it's easier for me to use a computer. And it's not just the technical stuff. Students have learned the importance of research and writing. You can choo like choose different words than just you know like if you have like Tuesday you like uh, t another T word and it sounds better than just a normal word. Um, they're learning skills to interview teachers. They've got to go around and find out the news for the day. Teacher Jeff Lee supervises the team, but since he needs to be in his classroom in the morning, they're running it independently. Uh, which I think is pretty amazing. I don't know if many 10-year-olds are able to run a, a TV studio. What an educational and fun experience. For In the Know, I'm Colleen Nelson. High school students at Fort Vancouver are also putting their video production skills into action. In the fall and winter, they produce Fort Sports. Once or twice a week, students and volunteers broadcast football, volleyball, or basketball. In the winter, they started broadcasting basketball live for the very first time. Teacher Andy Burhow runs the show and knows what this means for students. I haven't seen many high school sports productions that look like what we're producing. It's real experience in terms of, you know, we have a real product, we have a real deadline. I mean, the, the whistle's going to blow and the game is going to start. And when it does, it's a whirlwind of activity in the booth that closely mirrors what happens during professional broadcasts and the product reflects that level of commitment. You can watch all kinds of student-created programming on Comcast Channel 28 and YouTube. You can see Sacagawea Skyhawk News, The Young Filmmakers Project, which spotlights student movies, and CR News, a student-produced news show from Columbia River High School. Over on Channel 29, Ford Sports offers a full schedule of games starting in the fall. Plus, every high school puts out concert performances throughout the school year. In our story about the We Learn event, you saw a robot from Skyview High School, but it's not a toy. As Nick Vol shows us, for robotics students, it's serious competition. 
The Memorial Coliseum behind me has hosted thousands of basketball and hockey games throughout the years, but today it's hosting a different kind of competition. The Skyview High School robotics team makes its final adjustments as it prepares for the first match of the day. The pits, deep in the bowels of Memorial Coliseum, are noisy and full of energy. These teams, 58 in all, spent six weeks preparing their robots, with each team member serving a different role. Because they're experiencing the same thing that you know, uh, engineers in the, in the real world experience, which is teamwork, the importance of communication. Now, they take the creations from the classroom to a much larger stage. As you can see behind me, the crowd here at Memorial Coliseum is pretty big, and it's easy to understand that once you walk through these double doors and see the show that's going on down on the floor. Here's how it works. Six teams compete at once. They're put on one of two sides, red or blue. Working with their new alliance, the teams direct their robots to pick up the inflatable rings and deposit them on the hooks hanging from the end walls. With so much going on, the machines must perform, but the human element is just as important. Uh, no, working together is a really big part of what, you know, making sure that our alliance comes together. As the Stormbots approach the battlefield, they talk strategy with their new allies. We're really good at getting up on the top shelf and things like getting the top ones. So like if we had a team that was a short robot, then we would want to only put ours on the top and they would put theirs on the bottom. And so we try to like utilize what we're good at and what they're good at. From Skyview High School in Vancouver, Washington, Stormbots. Keep your eyes on robot number 2811. In this first match, things don't start off well as the robot drops the inflatable ring twice. We had made a change to the way our grabber grabbed because we had been popping tubes in the last match yesterday. So we um, added some surgical tubing to kind of prevent that, but it made it too slippery. But the team sticks with it, and the points begin to pile up as Blue dominates the match. Our alliance score as a group was 96, and then the Red Alliance had, I think, 12. So we did pretty good. We went out there today with a good game plan of like what we wanted to accomplish, and I think we did that really well. With more rounds to come, the team makes adjustments. Trying to get our little grabber thing improved. At the end of the two-day competition, Skyview found itself in 18th place out of 58 competitors. Of course, taking the regionals would have been nice, but the team walked away as winners nonetheless. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of work, but when the six weeks is over and our bot is back in school and we're all just sitting around talking, it's all good memories, it's all good thoughts coming out at the very end. For In The Know, I'm Nick Vole. For dedicated students learning how to build and program robots begins at an early age. We caught up with students at the Lego Robotics Competition at Salmon Creek Elementary. This qualifying match determined who would move on to the regionals. Students had to get their robots to complete a series of tasks. More than just circuits and wires, these students are learning another lesson. Uh, so far I've learned that teamwork is a really important thing in life. <laughs> it's not that easy to do it by yourself, that you have to do it with, with your team. The Gateway to Technology program at Jason Lee Middle School is one of their most popular electives. It gives students a chance to build elevators, cars, and other moving objects. Susan Van Houten teaches the class and says the hands-on nature of robotics encourages learning. Get in there, touch it, feel it, do it. Make it real. If it's not real, if, it, if they're just reading it out of a book, it's not real. Students design their own machines and then have to program them to function using circuitry planning software. So far, we've shown you technology that students are learning how to use, but some devices serve as tools to help teachers explain traditional subjects. Colleen Nelson introduces us to Starboards. I will learn to round numbers to the nearest hundred. It's a simple lesson plan presented in a whole new way. Hazeldale third grade teacher Kirk Fitzer is one of many Vancouver teachers using a starboard. It's like a chalkboard, movie projector, overhead projector, and more rolled into one. I think it's really cool because you could pause stuff and then just write on it and do the things that you need to do and example it while it's going. Mr. Fitzer uses his finger or a wand to interact with the images on the screen, clicking on websites, dragging numbers around, or writing over the top of the display. The interaction captures the student's attention. First thing, the kids are engaged. They like to go to the web, um, web games and play. He gets to go online and get all kinds of fun things. Like we had a shark one, if you get the answer right, there's like a shark comes up. If you get the answer wrong, the shark comes up and bites your boat. I kind of think like I'm fooling them a little bit because they don't know that I'm going to all of a sudden stop and start using it as a teaching tool and start teaching and then 
hopefully they're learning from the game that we're playing too. In this lesson, Mr. Fitzer uses three approaches to help the students understand how to round numbers. First, students step to the starboard to drag numbers where they belong on the line. Then, using a website tool, every student lines up to choose which direction to round a randomly chosen number. Finally, Mr. Fitzer uses the starboard to help explain a traditional worksheet, which he uses to gauge the students' progress. Do they need more help? Do they, do they have it? Can I move on? And if not, which individuals need help so maybe I can pull them out in a small group? On this day, every child gets the lesson and the class scores 100% on the number rounding game. Wow! Awesome job. You guys are great. The visual and tactile nature of the starboards also helps students who learn differently. It can reach other learners and different styles. And so a little bit of incorporation here and there, um, I think really pays off and, and helps some students learn. The starboards are now widely used throughout Vancouver Public Schools. Mr. Fitzer and other teachers got together to help raise grant money to pay for some of the units. For In the Know, I'm Colleen Nelson. Another device that helps teachers are responder devices. They're basically handheld polling machines that connect to a computer. Teachers can ask questions and get immediate feedback from every member of the class all at once. It allows them to see what students are getting and what needs more instruction. Students see a payoff too. I think it just makes me feel good about where I am because I see how everyone else answered and if a bunch of other people got the same thing wrong then I don't feel so bad. So we can find out within a class period or two how we did so we know I guess exactly what to go back and relearn or work on. The responder devices can also be used to administer tests. Since the answers are collected instantly, test scores can go out to parents immediately. It also reduces grading time, giving teachers more time to work on their lessons. Along the same lines as responders, Mobi tablets give teachers a new way to interact with their students. And as Orion Ludlow shows us, the kids are then more involved with their lessons. The uh, engagement is just fully there. They Fourth like grade teacher Martin Campos can't hide his enthusiasm for a new pilot program that puts tablet devices in his classroom. They're called Mobis, and they're changing the way many Vancouver teachers present information. Instead of having students come forward to write on the blackboard, Teachers have them use the Mobi pads to write on an overhead projector display. As many as six Mobis can work simultaneously. We can all do something at the same time. It works out good because we can just stay at our desks. In this lesson, Mr. Campos has the children working on their daily calendar, divvying up math tasks to groups of students. They each have a role, they're each engaged, and the Mobi just allows them to interact together between the groups, showing their work. What used to take 45 minutes now takes just 20. More importantly, students don't have to wait for someone else to finish. They're busy the entire time working together to find the answers. Because they're sharing the Mobi, one person gets to put their answer using the Mobi, then it passes on to the next person who then can add on to that person's response. Uh, all the while, kind of either they're self-correcting or helping each other out or collaboratively coming. If you don't know a question to something, but you raise your hand and you only know half of it, the other classmate in your group can help you figure out that question. Even when they start talking, um, and it sounds like they're not on board, the talking is always about the elements of whatever it is that we're doing using the Mobis. That excitement among the students means they're truly involved with the lesson. Our kids are digital natives, and they learn best through technology, and so to be able to hand them a tablet and allow them to interact with the technology as they're learning um, is a really positive experience for them. It's actually a lot easier, I think, than before, than just worksheets. It's more fun. For In the Know, I'm Orion Ludlow. Just about everybody has seen a YouTube video, and the popular video sharing site is another tool for teachers. YouTube has thousands of educational videos, all for free. The district believes that visual presentations can help different kinds of learners get a better grasp of the subject matter. It also puts more information at teachers' fingertips. Just like Google uh, provides access to a wide variety of, of print and, and uh, text sources, YouTube is kind of the, the video equivalent of that and allows them a wealth of resources that they can then choose to use as they see fit. YouTube is only available to teachers, not students. And to make sure that videos are appropriate for children, teachers must watch them all the way through and enter their personal access code before pressing play. Vancouver Public Schools is fully engaged on YouTube and other social media. 
To hook up with the district online and keep an eye on what's happening in our schools, go to our YouTube page. You can also try us on Facebook and Twitter. The easiest way to find us is to simply go to the district website, vansd.org. There are links to all of our social media pages at the top and bottom of our homepage. Part of the school district's technological shift is trying new approaches to teaching and learning. With that in mind, a pilot program at King Elementary had every third grader using iPod Touches. Some volcanoes shoot out gas and rocks. We're used to listening to music from our iPods, but third graders at King Elementary are listening to themselves. The students read out loud, recording their voices as they go. Then they can analyze and critique their own reading as the recording plays back. Teachers Kara Bu and Jamie Donovan downloaded applications or apps that give the children new ways to be self-directed as they learn. It's not as much of me at the front of the room telling the kids how to do things. It's, it's me getting them started on an app and it's a lot more independent than it's been in the past. More than just a glorified tape recorder, the iPod touch screens also allow the kids to learn math in a fun, engaging way. <coughs> We're playing math games, addition, subtraction, Multiplication. Do like seven and three to get to ten. And while the lesson plans are about traditional subjects like reading and math, they're also a way to introduce students to the technology of the future. Um, I definitely think it'll help them out in the future. As we know, technology just gets better and better and there's more of it. And I think that exposing them, especially if they don't have it at home, makes a big difference in school. Do you have anything like this at home or have you used anything like this before? No. Do you have anything like that at home or is it just here? No. I never do it at home. As you may be able to tell, these students may be a bit camera shy. But Ms. Bew says they aren't shy at all when it comes to finishing their lessons with the iPods. But most of the kids have never used them before, but they take to them pretty quickly. The reason why is pretty obvious. Yes, I like math and I like games. Well, we get to use games and we get to use them at school. But these interactive devices are also being used at Fort Vancouver High School to teach students how to tackle more complex mathematic concepts. On their eye touches, students watch videos that guide them through math problems instead of hearing a lecture. Um, it shows us step by step and it pretty much teaches, or teaches us all the things we need to know how to do it. So students who get it the first time can just get done and be done, but the students who are having problems and typically might not want to raise their hand because they're embarrassed can just go back and watch the video again. I can replay over and over and over again until I get it, and when the teacher explains it to us, she just explains it probably like once or twice, and we don't really get it sometimes, so I think the iPad is really good for us. A class full of self-directed students also gives Miss Barry the time to give individual help to those who need it. Just about anyone who's used a computer is familiar with Google. You can use it to look up a word, find a restaurant, and in one Vancouver classroom, you can learn about your ancestors. Teacher Greg Ross is using Google Earth, a 3D mapping application, to teach his history students about their ancestors. The students interviewed their relatives about family history, then, using Google Earth, mapped out the paths around the globe their ancestors took to get to Vancouver. It's a hands-on approach. That makes it easier for students to grasp big ideas. The, the use of Google Earth I thought would be a great way to, to really have the students internalize the idea of immigration and migration mm -hmm. and, and to show them that you, know, you all came from somewhere. You, know, you didn't all come from the same place and everyone's had different struggles from where they've come from and different challenges and different types of adversity, but we've all kind of wound up here together. In addition to plotting out where their ancestors lived, the students had to use basic HTML, the language that programmers use to build websites. <laughs> students at Sarah J. Anderson Elementary graduate from computer camp in front of their family and friends. The camp was run by instructors from Clark College. The students met after school for several weeks and learned the basics of computer games and animations using software designed at MIT. I learned how to make shapes with different characters and how to make um, Pac-Man and some other games I made. It was really fun and cool to make all these different crazy animations and fun games. At the end of the camp, students showed off what they had been building. For every movement or behavior of the objects on the screen, the students had to create rules using computer code. Most kids play video games, but now these students have a better idea what it takes to make their games work. And that knowledge 
has put their minds in motion. I'm gonna make games that are in 3D, because I'm really into 3D now. Yeah. Yeah. How about you? Uh, yeah, and I might teach my little cousin. He's in fourth grade, and because he likes games a lot. The money to pay for the camp supplies was granted to the school by a teacher at Anderson. For finishing the camp, the students got certificates of completion and their pictures taken with the Clark College mascot. When it comes to science and technology, college administrators and business leaders are asking for better equipped young people, and Vancouver Public Schools are answering the call. In 2012, the school district plans to open a STEM school. In the fall, the district hosted a symposium to gather ideas. One of the featured guests was an administrator from a STEM school in San Diego. One of that school's key successes is building partnerships with businesses and colleges, something Vancouver is looking to emulate. Providing uh, direct mentors to, to students of engineers, for example, providing internships, externships for teachers, uh, it's a way to connect the education piece to what the industry really requires or is, is looking for. For students, a STEM education improves their readiness for college and careers in high-tech fields. We're preparing students uh, to be collaborators, communicators. Uh, they're going to be producers of information. And uh, through all of those, I mean, those are all skill sets that not only they need to demonstrate as students, but certainly they'll be expected to demonstrate as students beyond high school and in the work world. Even though money is tight, the district believes that working with partners to create a comprehensive plan will also help our local economy. To stay local, go to the Clark College, go to WSU and get a high quality STEM related education and then stay within our local community in a STEM field and not feel like they have to move away to find those job opportunities. The proposed plan would locate the school in either an existing school or new facility and would host students in grades 6 through 12. Preparing the leaders of the future is why teachers teach. Vancouver Public Schools are working hard so students will be ready to overcome the economic and technological challenges ahead. It starts with the big picture, pushing kids to develop self-motivation, the drive to learn, innovate and succeed. Then with valuable practical skills learned in school, students in Vancouver Public Schools have the tools to turn big plans into reality. Thanks for watching this In the Know special. I'm Helen Raptus. And I'm Chad Young. We'll see you in the fall for another exciting school year.